Allora, eh, ben ritrovati, invito di nuovo tutti a... Welcome back, I'd like to mute your smartphones and chat, and chat, and chat, sorry, chat apps. So that we can start in a few seconds, I urge you all to take your seats again. Mi scuso per questo piccolo ritardo che è dovuto ad alcune questioni tecniche. A volte la tecnologia non I apologize for the delay, we're just having some technical difficulties. Io sarò davvero molto rapida. Innanzitutto devo ringraziare Carlo Ratti perché grazie. First of all, I'd like to thank Carlo Ratti because thanks to a book he published in 2014 on open source design, I won a prize applying it to a totally different context. But it's really a book that I recommend you all read because it's really inspiring be those for those who deal with management and even for those who deal with design, but also for those who in Italy, in Italy they're not called futurists, but people have um, future related skills and whoever is interested in understanding how the ability uh, to connect and connect in intelligence and knowledge, uh, whoever is interested in that and will be interested in this book. So Carlo Ratti is, uh, will talk to us not only about how technology is changing uh, cities, but also a number of other themes connected to this matter and we'll surely have the opportunity to explore in this inspiring uh, address, he teaches at the MIT and he's the director of this lab. It's called Sensible City. You have the floor. Thank you. I see someone with the headphones. Uh, I'd like to understand whether to do it in Italian, uh, my whole speech, Italian, English. Who prefers it? Who prefers Italian? Jesse and I would have, let, 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 let me do it in English for our guests, so I think, you know, I think let's, uh, let's do it in English for our guests. So, um, first of all, thanks, uh, thanks everybody, so uh, good to be here with, um, with all of you. Um, I, I just wanted to share something and then we have a conversation. The conversation, by the way, we'll do um, Italian, English, whatever, you can use any, any of the two languages. I, I thought in English is just, you know, is a, is a welcoming sign for. Um, now, I want to tell you about um, what uh, I would call the playground city. Now, together with uh, Ed Glazer, Ed is um, the head of the department of, sorry guys, uh, can we, Yes, so maybe if somebody wants to talk, there's a lot of space uh, outside. Ed Glazer is the head of the, the Department of, of um, Economics at Harvard. And uh, Ed and I just did an, article, did an article a few months ago in the New York Times. Uh, the title the Times gave is, uh, is about 26, 26 Empire State Building could fit into New York's empty office space. And that's a sign. And this is about you know, what has been happening following COVID. So I just wanted to share with you just want to share with you a few things, you know, of what we've been studying and so on in, uh, in, in recent months and what actually came from this. But let me first look at the situation in New York. Um, I, I just came back and um, for a few days, so again, it's a 26 Empire State Building. That's a lot of space that actually is free now. And uh, if you look at this, it's quite uh, striking. Is the fact that actually, um, if you look at this, is over the past 20 years, you see how many empty offices we have, vacancies. And you see that that uh, was, uh, even at the top of the financial crisis, was less than 20%. Now, look at how high it is. It's much higher than it has ever been, and so on. So that's quite a big, big change in our cities. And I'll be very happy then to talk with you about what's happening in different cities, like, you know, San Francisco, what's happening in Boston, what's happening in New York. There are different things. I think Europe is a little bit behind because uh, the, somehow, you know, the U.S. is a bit more flexible for a number of things, so you see changes you see them faster but the same changes we're seeing in the u.s you know are coming to europe and uh, you know coming to italy you know you see them in london already and they're coming uh, globally so i want to share them with you briefly because this is going to be a big uh, it's going to have a big impact on how our cities work where people live 
where people work, on how we organize spaces in the city and so on. So let me just share with you a few, a few things. So in order to look at what's happening, let's do a step back. And uh, so let's look at the past. And I want to share with you some data we've been collecting on the MIT campus. What you see here um, is the MIT campus. It's like a little town inside uh, the greater Boston. You see it there, and you see Boston downtown. You see Harvard, don't bother, up there. Um, but somehow, you know, this is like almost like a little town. What you see in the middle is actually the Charles River that divides uh, Cambridge. Uh, Cambridge is uh, here uh, from, uh, from Boston. So what we did was from the very beginning, 15 years ago, we started actually looking at uh, how people use space on campus, in particular through Wi-Fi. If you look at Wi-Fi data, now it has become very common. But at the very beginning, you know, uh, you can look at Wi-Fi data and see where people are. So it tells you something interesting, especially thinking about today, what's happening today is about you know, where people are and, uh, and, and how to use space. And so we started monitoring, this was a few years ago, we started monitoring a big change. People used to work, as you see there, to the left. And now tend to work, as you see there, to, to the right. Now, these two pictures are a bit extreme, uh, are a bit extreme because to the left you see the most appalling computer room I could find. And actually to the right uh, you see a beautiful sunny day. I need to tell you, during the winter when it's minus 20 Celsius, is, uh, it's not the same. But you get a sense of the change and that those changes have been happening globally. You know, we used to work like this. That's actually, by the way, what is this? Which picture is this? Any thoughts? It's a famous movie. It's a movie by Jacques Tati, the great, it's a movie by Jacques Tati, the great uh, uh, French director called Playtime. So that's actually in Playtime, you see, we used to work in these kind of cubicles and now we tend to work in places like this. Incidentally, this is one of our design. I, I have two hats. One hat is at MIT where we do research. The other hat, we got a design office in uh, New York, in Italy, in London. And actually, and also we are working, we are very happy to be working in Rome for the master plan for the Expo Roma 2030. If you want, I can share it later. It's not part of today's presentation. I'm happy to, to share it. But so this is actually, this is actually one of the biggest um, co-working places in Southern Europe is Talent Garden in Milan that we designed a few, few years ago. But that gives you a sense of how much the workplace has been changing from this to this. And we monitor all of that by looking at data. Again, if you got data, I told you Wi-Fi data, you can discover interesting things. For instance, what you see here, every dot is a Wi-Fi access point on the MIT campus. And then when you know the access point, you know how many people are connected to it. And you know the ID. It can be anonymized, but you know the ID of the, the, the laptops or the, the smartphones they're using. So what you see here, the bubble, tells you how many people you have at different times of the day. What you see here is actually a normal day on the MIT campus, uh, 9 a.m. People actually, the bubble, the size of the bubble tells you how many people you have in that building. And then how people move at the, in the morning, they are more in the places like in the, in the dorms, and then they move to the classrooms, and then they move to the place where they can eat something. So, so for the first time, we can look at this. By the way, when we did this, it was nobody had done it, and that has become quite common. Many companies are using the same signals to monitor how space is being, is being used. For instance, let me give you a, a, a little um, kind of uh, think of the, this, you could call it the heartbeat of the MIT campus. What you see here is the different uh, days of the week, so Monday, Tuesday, uh, all the way until Sunday. And this is actually the activity on campus, which is interesting. And by the way, this was still before COVID. This is changing a lot. But basically, you see people get into campus around 9 a.m. Then, you know, a few of them leave at 5, you know, 9 to 5, but it's very few. Actually, most people keep working till very late at night. Even in the middle of the night, you got quite a lot of activity on the, on the campus. And then the same thing happens on Monday or Tuesday, on Wednesday, on Thursday, not on Friday. Like tomorrow, you see it's Friday activity, like all over the world, slips away very quickly, as you see here. And then Saturday and Sunday are almost like to, to normal day. You just remove the nine to five, and but the baseline is, is very similar. And you can do this for the whole campus here at the top, but you can also look at different like residential, or you can look at, at academic and service. You can, you can cut the activity based on different uh, functions. Now, this one is aggregated, but you can look at this for every room. And if you want, tomorrow we'll be able to look at this for every square meter. What's happening in China, which is also a bit concerning, is that through sensing, you know every square meter you have, how it's being used over time. But what you get is curves like that. That is always a curve that tells you over a week, 
you know, how activity changes in the course of the week and, you know, what people are doing in the space. And spaces work with different ways. You've got different types of signatures for, for every space. We done a number of papers on this before COVID. And this is really something that we believe is changing a lot, the way we can both build and manage real estate. If you think about the university, for instance, one of the crazy things is that, you know, we have a huge amount of space. And by the way, the least used typology of space, you can imagine, is the office, is a uh, professor office. You know, the professor office, because the professor by definition is never there. You have an office, you have a space, and you know, the professor by definition is a classroom, is meeting other people, is meeting the students, is at a conference. So we're building a huge amount of space that's not used, but so far it was difficult to quantify. Now we can actually quantify it, and that can help us to better use real estate, but also to design it better uh, at the beginning. Now, um, and again, you can see some of the papers. You can do a bit of big data analytics. You know, this is simple Fourier transform on the data to look at uh, periodicity. But you can look at uh, many other dimensions of this. We've been doing a few papers where we use eigen decomposition. We call them eigen places, so places that work in a similar way by clustering different typology of spaces. So all of this is uh, what we were doing uh, before COVID. And uh, again, it's an interesting thing that uh, 15 years ago when we started was new, and now it's been used in many places all around the world in order to look at how we use buildings and how, you know, how people use physical space. Incidentally, and again, if you want, we can talk a bit later, that's also very interesting for sustainability because with this, you can make sure that uh, you don't put heating and cooling if there's nobody there. So you can create interesting feedback loops in the way you manage the building. You know, we, we, we spend, we waste a huge amount of heating during the winter to, to heat empty buildings. And the same for during the summer for cooling and building. So somehow this becomes it. Now, but let's get now to COVID, which is where we started. And you know, many experiments somehow, sometimes happen really a bit randomly. You know, think about you know many, many experiments in science. You know, one of the most beautiful one, my, my favorite one, is about mirror neurons in Italy. There was a big discovery that happened accidentally. Now, in this case, I, I'm not saying we got a similar level discovery, but we discovered something interesting accidentally. And the reason is the following. Before COVID, it took us more or less uh, two years to get approvals from the MIT Ethical Commission, Ethical Board, is called COIS, the Commission, of, the, commission the Committee on the Use of, uh, of Humans as Subjects. So it's, it's what is called in all the places, in all universities, the ERB, Ethical Review Board. So it took us around two years to convince them that we could anonymize data on the MIT campus and analyze email exchanges. What you saw here was only, you know, Wi-Fi connections. But we wanted to create a network of who's connecting with whom. Anonymize, we don't know who the people are, but we wanted to do it. And we got, went through a very good, that deep review process in order to, to make sure, you know, that all was anonymized in the proper way. So just a few months before COVID, we finally had access to this data that you see here. So the data is email data. It started in December 27, December 27, 2019, three months before COVID. And we started collecting data on the campus, anonymized, that allows you to create a network. So the network of who's connecting with whom, which is very interesting. You don't know how different people on space, you don't know who they are, who they are but they know they are connected through email communication. So we started collecting it, and uh, you see them here, here, got the different, uh, sorry, I don't see the back, but you know, you got the different uh, information about the data set. And then what happens is the experiment that you can never do. You know, one of the problems in economics, in sociology, is that all the variables are connected. You don't know, there's always a chicken and egg problem. The best way to understand causality is if you take a variable, you remove it, and then you put it back. But clearly, when you're, doing a, when you're analyzing a real system, like a campus, you cannot do it. You cannot tell people, I, you don't go to campus, and I want to see what happens to your social networks. But COVID did it for us. So with all its tragedy, COVID became the experiment that you can never do. Because it took a variable, physical space, and removed it. So, so it, again, as I said, it was total random. We started three months before, and then, you know, COVID came, and the experiment that is the ideal experiment you'd like to do, but you are never allowed to do, was done for us, was imposed on us by COVID. And COVID is when, basically, so what happened is one variable, key variable, physical space, what got discontinuous on the 23rd of March, 2020. Before that, we were going to the campus. After that, 
we stop going there. So physical space vanish and disappear. And um, so the first thing we did, look at just what I'm showing you now is before big data analytics. Before you do the analytics, you just want to put your hands in the data, right? You want to look at it, how it looks, and so on. So let me show you just how this looks, how the MIT network looks before the lockdown, before the 23rd of March, uh, 2020. And uh, if you plot it, it looks like this. This is MIT, so you see all the communication, you see the different departments, you see they are in you know, different schools, uh, you know, architecture, science, engineering, and so on. And this is just a visual representation, yet not yet big data analytics, but visual representation. If you do exactly the same visualization, but actually later, after lockdown, already you see something has changed. And this is you know, just a few months later, during the lockdown, the same thing looks like this. So again, something is different, but we didn't know what it was. This is only a way these kind of things, these kind of images, are done with different type of spring-based models, so they're not in a big scientific analysis. They're simply you know, a way to visualize quickly what happens on, on the network. So at that point, we started investigating, trying to understand what the hell happened. You move physical space, and something changes the way we communicate. If we don't meet in physical space, if we don't meet in the city, if we don't meet in public space, if we don't meet here, I mean, I mean, somehow you're meeting here. You know, it looks like you have come from different places, in, even very far away, to come here. It's uh, you know, physical space is something that you cannot replace easily. Otherwise, this morning we would all be connected on, on Zoom. So there's something magic that happens here, and the question is, what it is? By the way, this magic is probably something that dates back to 10,000 years ago when our ancestors, uh, for the first time, discovered cities as a way to bring us together. So bring us together in physical space so that together we can be more than each of us individually. Somehow there's something that's connected to what a city is, what an office is, what uh, a physical space we share is. So we started looking, and we did a lot of analysis, um, and we couldn't find anything. But in the end, we found a hint. And this turned out to be true. Let me do a step back. Think about all your friends in your network, all the people you know. And think about classifying them in two categories. One category you call them weak ties. One category you call them strong ties. Let's start from strong ties. Strong ties means, you know, call it a person A knows a person B and a person C. And B and C also are friends with each other. So if you draw it, you get a triangle, like the blue thing you see there. And just a definition, call it strong tie. is a friend who's also a friend of your friends. So you combine. And then just a definition, think about weak ties. So what is a weak tie? A weak tie is, is somebody you know, but it's not a friend of your friends. And then it becomes a bridge to a different community. This is only a definition you see then here. So you see the, the orange one is actually a weak tie. It's not a friend of your friends, it connects you to another community, while the blue one is a strong tie, it's a friend who's also a friend of your friends. That's just a definition. Now, it was discovered in a very important paper, probably the most important paper in sociology in the past 50 years, which is this one. It was a, it, it's a paper from 1973, exactly 50 years ago, by sociologists who at the time was at John Hopkins University, but now is actually a Stanford, he's in, uh, 80 something, but he's still teaching at Stanford. It was, it was discovered actually weak ties are very important. And the reason is that very simple. You know, think about your strong ties. When you talk to them, the same information goes, moves around in circle. You tell something to your close friends who are friends of your friends and they share it with their friends. And so somehow you end up in this kind of uh, echo chambers. The information goes around the triangle, we said before, and so it keeps coming back. But the most important information in life is the things uh, you don't know. You're not, the, the information that's not in your circle of friends, but actually you get out from outside, from other communities, from people who are more different from you. So in this paper, what Granovetter discovered, hypothesized, I would say at the time, he did a small experiment, but he didn't have big data in 73, so he, he discovered it, but also in a kind of a bit simplified way at the time, because of the lack of large data sets, is actually that weak ties are very strong, are very important. That's why the title, the strength of weak ties, that basically the most important information in life is what comes from weak ties. 
And especially when you think about creativity, about all the things you know, that are important, today, you know, those things used often are very connected to weak ties. Also, how we respond to challenges to our social network, how resi the resilience of our social network also is very related to the weak ties, which is uh, how we can probably connect better to other parts of society. And that you know, can actually make all of us more, more resilient ourselves. Anyway, that's in a nutshell what's in this paper. If you, if you haven't read it, now have a look. It's, uh, it's beautifully written. It's uh, one of the landmark papers in sociology in the past, uh, past 50 years. But I think at this point, you've, uh, you've already understood what we have discovered, more or less. And uh, this is our paper, by the way, from a year and a half ago. It's uh, in Nature Computational Science. Uh, we call it the effect of collocation on human communication network. So what is the effect of space on our social networks? By the way, when I say social networks, I don't mean the social networks like you know, Facebook. I mean you know, the, the human communication networks. And, uh, and by the way, in, and if, you, if you look at this, it's something we did at MIT, but also we collaborated. You, you may see one of the authors is Robin Dunbar. As you might know, Robin is the inventor of the Dunbar number. Robin is a professor at Oxford. And the Dunbar number is uh, this number that tells uh, the average number of friends we all have. Robin, all his life, has been studying different communities, human, monkeys, and so on, animal and human communities, and discovered actually there's certainly something like an upper bound. There's a certain number that describes how many friends we have. But what you're finding here is that those friends, when you, don't, when you remove physical space, become much more stable. You lose a lot of, lot of weak ties. And you see it very, very well in this image. This is actually the new weak ties created on the MIT campus. So daily created on the MIT campus. And look at what happened. The red line is the day of lockdown. The reason it's going down is that even before lockdown, everybody was scared. You know, I remember the, the beginning of 2020, I was in the US, and actually people were looking at the news coming from Milan. And uh, people in New York and Boston thought, you know, well, this is a way, this is far, it will never happen. But actually in March, everybody got scared. And so they started going less and less to campus. Well, analyzing this huge amount of data from the email network, what you see is that uh, starting in February, when people go less to the campus, and then with that red line, which is the day of lockdown, nobody is allowed anymore to uh, campus. There's a weak tie ringing somewhere. So nobody goes anymore to, to campus. Then at that point, uh, you see that the number of weak ties goes down almost 80%. Now, I will not show you all the results from the paper, but the paper is online if you want to, to see it. And what we discovered as well, we looked at what happened last year, when actually lockdown was lifted fully and we went back to campus, and actually that number goes back up. Somehow the magic of physical space is probably the very reason that you're all here today, is the fact that by being here today, you make connection. It wouldn't happen on Zoom. On Zoom, you might be in the same, in the same virtual room and talk and chat with your friends of friends, the people you already know, but the kind of these magic connections that connect you to a new community happen here when you're in person. They happen in an office when we go back to the office. They happen in a, in a city, in public space. And I would say that they're very, very important because one of the things that we saw as well is that if you, only, if you like those weak ties, you also tend to get more polarized. You know, polarization that's uh, very, very strong today in the United States and in Europe, political polarization, for instance. And that's related to the fact that you're connecting less with diversity. And so you diverge just in your bubble into one direction or the other one. So you polarize. So somehow, you know, that was in physical space is important. So I would say that the important thing is that we bring back physical space, more and more encounters in physical space in different ways. Uh, and um, by the way, if you look at this also, this is the overall network, another visualization, this overall network of communication on the MIT campus. And you see this is almost like a brain that's shrinking, that's atrophizing, because you're missing all these kind of weak ties. So little by little, you connect more but with people you already know, with strong ties, less with weak ties. And so what is, what is the, the, the natural of this? So basically, what do we see and what, we pro what do we propose in the article in the New York Times? That, by the way, the article we did in the New York Times in May is now being used for some action in New York. I think I started a very nice conversation in the city. I was, I was very interested because, you know, I thought that people don't read newspapers anymore. Um, so we wrote, we wrote that article with the Glazer. And that day, it was the second most read article in the New York Times, just second to 
Donald Trump sexcapades. So I think, you know, I thought it was quite, quite interesting. People are very ex interested about some of these topics. And, and I think that the, the balance we need to find is find new ways to meet and create weak ties, but at the same time realize that people don't want to spend all day in the office as they did before. That's, that now is a given. We know that, you know, it's not going to change. We want to have one, two, three days of smart working per week. But at the same time, we need to find new ways to, to promote encounters. And here I wanted to finish with a few examples of some of the work we do with our uh, design office. This is a new museum in Milan. I took two examples. We, we work a lot uh, glo globally, especially in Singapore, in, in, in the United States. But I just want to show two projects in, um, in, um, in Italy. Uh, this one is, um, is a new museum in Milan. It's uh, called MEET, um, Digital Museum in Milan. And here we try to create this kind of lobby that also functions as a connector where people really can meet much better, people working there, people meeting and so on. So the, the, here you see it here, that's a meet. Uh, and, uh, and, that becomes, and that was a way to use architecture to create new type of spaces that facilitate encounters between people. Before this space in Milan, you know, there, was, there was a building, but then you know, the connection, the vertical connection were just something to connect A to B without creating a place for encounter. We turned that into this kind of vertical plaza, 50 meter high, where actually people can meet and cross paths and have conferences on the, this beautiful picture, I didn't bring it today, of, of people using this as a, as a conference space where they can meet and, and share ideas. Or oh, this is a new, this will be actually will be um, launched by the President of the Republic in Italy uh, just in a couple of weeks. It's in Milan, it's a new campus of the University of Milan, so the first stone, the breaking ground. In Italian, the breaking, breaking ground is called putting the first stone. Uh, pause up and that will happen in a couple of weeks. I will have to, to give a thing. This will be the new campus on the University of Milan in, uh, in Milan. Again, where the whole thinking is how we can do a university. Let's face it, even at MIT, people don't want to come to campus. But so you need to do a university where actually there's enough there in programming to, fa to, to be able to be stronger, to fight, to, to be better than the convenience on the internet. So you need to make sure that people will want to be there because there is something exciting happening. We created here this kind of common ground the first, uh, the, the ground level, is with a lot of rich programming that we hope will be what will drag people out of their homes, out of watching lectures just on, on their computer screen, and going there to meet together. So that together, as we said at the beginning, like it happened 10,000 years ago, we see this together, we can be more than each of us individually. Now, I'll stop here. I've got many more slides I can share with you, but I'll stop here and we can have maybe a bit, bit of conversation together. Thank you. I think we have, uh, I, I, we took like half an hour, so we have like 10 minutes for, uh, for, for Q&A. So if, if anybody has some thoughts or questions or di disagreement or urges, you know, feel free to raise your hand. And uh, is there a microphone or? Yes, there's a microphone. Yes. And by the way, I'll, um, feel free if you want to ask a question in Italian, that's fine as well. I can, I can take both in Italian and English. But go ahead. It would be fantastic to understand how you apply your research, which is fantastic, to a project like the new campus in Milan. Because yeah. obviously you are taking it from the MIT. Yeah. It's a very interesting analysis of what is happening there. How do you use this kind of intelligence when you are going to, to yeah. uh, go planning a project like the new campus? Yeah, no, thank you. It's, um, it's really a good question. Is, you know, how can we turn this knowledge, the research knowledge, into design? And the truth is that, you know, we believe that design, and this is something that was mentioned at the very beginning about the book, uh, this old book from nine years ago called uh, Open Source Architecture. And then, you know, we believe that design should take an approach that's similar to what nature does. You know, that's based on mutation, trying things and getting feedback. And opening up the design code is the first step. So the answer to your question is that I think we don't have a solution yet. And I think everybody on the planet is looking for a solution. What will be the design of an office tomorrow? What will be the design of a university tomorrow? I was talking to our new president, our new rector at MIT, and she really had this question, you know, how do we bring people back? What can we do? So I think the question is open. But I think we can use design as an evolutionary tool in order to try different things, see what works, what doesn't work, and let things evolve, which is really what nature does and is similar to what was mentioned at the beginning, this kind of idea of open source. You know, you try something, you share results, and by doing this, we'll find something. Now, I think nobody has a solution yet. I think the, the principle, however, seem to be clear. And the principle is about how 
we can find new ways to meet, but actually they go beyond the traditional way to meet. If you need to go to an office, we just have cubicles, like the image I showed you before of uh, Jacques Tati, those cubicles from the 70s, then you know, why do you go? It's just stay home, it's much more convenient. You can stay with your pajama, you avoid commuting and so on. But so if we go there, we need to find new programming for this. And that, in, in the article with, um, with Ed Glazer in the New York Times, we hypothesized this thing of playground city. You know, cities have been changing with the first industrial revolution, the second industrial revolution, the, what we do in cities has been changing. And so we think that this could be another moment where we're starting to see the emergence of a new city, a city where people still want to meet, a city that performs its primordial function of being a, a meeting place to create weak ties and so on, share ideas, but with a way that's a bit different than the late 20th century office tower where people don't seem to be interested in, in going back, and I, I understand why. So somehow design is, to answer your point is, I think, you know, I don't think we have a clear solution, but design is what can do it, and, and we, we are doing some bets in uh, Milan, you know, when you're designing something you want to try, and, you know, make sure that this can be adjusted later. So by, in Milan, by creating a very flexible common ground, we call it, so the first eight meters are very flexible programming, very transparent, the place where you can put more cafes or gathering places or learning places. So that thing should uh, hopefully help us to create uh, uh, different things and see how we can really leverage the power of physical space to, uh, to bring us together. Thanks. Any other thoughts? Yes, I see two hands, <coughs> one behind and one here in a... It just to ask if it is feasible, uh, or you think it's feasible, to adapt uh, the previous buildings to, uh, for example, you say that the skyscraper in New York, yeah. it's empty. If it's feasible to adapt those to a more um, work-friendly or whatever, because they are already built, yeah. the money is already expensed, it will be expensive to tear them down and to build, rebuild again. Is it feasible? Yeah. So that's again, by the way, that's uh, the, the, the other day, the other day a group of investors came to, to MIT, you know, MIT you got a bunch of people who come, you know, CEOs and so on. And once upon a time, people used to say, you know, this is the million dollar question. Then today people tend to say the, this is the billion dollar question because it, it makes it more impressive. But these people the other day asked the same question you ask and they call it, you know, this is the 53 trillion dollar question. And why is it? Because actually I believe, I didn't know it, but I believe that the total value of all the office stock globally is 53 trillion. Don't quote me on that. I just heard it. I just learned it from, from them. So this is certainly an important question. You know, certainly it's there, it's built, even from the point of view of climate change. You know, we certainly don't want to, to make it. Now, I think there's two things. If you want, still, I'm not saying that the office is dead. I'm saying that uh, we'll still go into the office, but if we go down 30%, still it's a big change. If you go down 25%, you know, people are now smart working two to three days a week. So it means you know, that potentially you can, you can uh, reduce the total number of stock significantly. Um, so I, I, some of it so can still be offices, but different type of offices, more open. Somehow what, what you're seeing in the office space today is a bifurcation, the, the, the modern, environmentally friendly, ESG compliant, you know, nice uh, places to work are still commanding high rents, but there's staff in New York, the old offices, nobody want to, to live there. In New York, you can buy now an old office tower for the price of the land. Sometimes, actually, the price of the land minus the cost of demolition. So somehow that's... Uh, so to be, go back to your point, one thing, what can we do with, uh, with all this? One is a lot of it will still be offices. I'm not saying that it will disappear, but it will have to be turned into more, uh, you know, friendly. Um, you, 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 can, you, can see for, you can say from legacy offices um, to something that you, you know, the playground office or something offices that really respond much better to the meeting we were saying. So one thing, that's one of the solution. Some of it can be converted in, um, in actually residential, but that's not easy for everything. There's a beautiful example, if you've been to Chicago recently, you might have seen the Chicago Tower, a beautiful iconic building in the center of Chicago next to the Apple Store, where the Chicago Tower was converted into residential and it's very successful. But the problem is the Chicago Tower is an old tower from 100 years ago, more than 100 years ago. And then at the time, you know, it was uh, quite thin. The difficult stuff to convert are the tower that started being built in the 50s and 60s because they got a very deep floor plan. 
the reason at the time, you know, people started using a lot of air conditioning and so on, so the big floor plan, and then it's difficult to turn it into an apartment. The reason is that if you have a house, you don't want to be over eight meters away from a window. You want to be close to window, to air, to a balcony, and so on. So if you've got something which is a huge floor plan, then it's difficult to convert it. So that's the stuff that's difficult to convert. People have suggested different things in the US. There's a few experiments. Uh, uh, I'm actually right now writing uh, something for San Francisco that goes in this direction. What, how you convert this? Is it, is it a design problem? But it's not so easy. It's more case by case. If it's slim tower, great. If it is a thick tower, well, you know, you need to see what you can put in, uh, in the core. So going back to, the, to summarize, so first thing, a lot of it will still be offices, over 50%, but we need to refurbish them, make them more sustainable, ESG compliant, and something people want to go, so more fun. Uh, some of it could be converted, and I think converted into, into residential. And then the third thing is also to see if we can convert something into new type of uh, functions. And uh, I, uh, here, you know, there's many people, one of the things I like most is, uh, one of the things people are suffering most following the pandemic is really about lack of re places where you can meet others and so on. This kind of, and so I think some of this, you know, there's an old concept in the United States, um, which is uh, uh, related to, uh, to create homes with a lot of social parts. It's the old idea of Charles Fourier in the uh, 19th century in France, the Phalanster. So even places where there's a lot of communal space, well, maybe that's another possible use for some of those, uh, those skyscrapers. Anyway, I'll, I'll stop here, but somehow that's, uh, $53 trillion question, so hopefully, I hope you will find a solution and, and get rich. I, I see one, one last uh, question here in the front. Yeah, well, thank you very much for this answer. I think that was one, one of them, but I'm glad it's been answered. But I, I do think that a way to probably solve a little bit everything has to do precisely to try to build, so not only to adapt what is already built into something that is more adaptable and much more kind of uh, taking into account all the knowledge we have. But I do think, and this is something that happened in my children's school, and, and I think it, it was magical. It was an old building. And the way they restore it was actually asking the questions to the children. Yeah. Like going beyond that idea of, of academic knowledge and everything and going back to the people and yeah. to know if you're going to be using that building, what would you do? And, and something as simple as the children would say, well, I would like to paint on the walls because that's what children like doing, right? And yeah. it is architecturally possible. So I do think that I don't know how much all the research is going into also asking the population. Yeah. And I do agree 100% that having multifunctional places, I would say, is what is into the future. So I, I just wanted yeah. to know what you think about that. No, I like it. I like it just to add, you know, I, this is a good way to, to finish and to wrap up. But basically, the, um, what we said at the very beginning, actually, the very starting thing was about open source architecture. Open source means that you, the design is something that can get input from many different people, from kids, from people living there, from people who are technical and non-technical. Now, the important thing is that you need to find different ways to allow people to participate. And here we actually did a project. Um, last year, we did a big project in Pristina, Kosovo. Um, that was a project, the urban project for the largest art biennale in Europe called uh, Manifesta. Manifesta is every two years in a different city. And Manifesta started um, five years ago to do not only the biennale, but actually to do a big urban study. The first one was actually in an Italian city in Palermo, and uh, Rem Kulas, uh, OMA, the Dutch uh, design office, did the study, the urban study for Palermo. Um, then it was Marseille in France, and actually that was done again by a Dutch uh, team, uh, Vini Mas and, and VRDV. And um, last year, it was manif Manifesta was in Pristina, and there we, we worked with the city and with Manifesta to do the same, to do this urban study. And what we did was really looking at this kind of multi-layer participation. So you want kids sometimes can have beautiful ideas, but you need to pay attention how you, your know, participation by somebody who goes there and says, I want to paint on the wall. is different than somebody who knows that, uh, you know, you've got a problem with air condition, you've got a structural problem, or you know, you've got technical things. So somehow you want to find a way of participation that, uh, that uh, allows for different people to contribute in different ways, even at the starting point, and that's great for a city. A starting point is just, you know, people who might vote with their feet, just by going there will manifest the fact that they like the place, or people who might want to be engaged on the same table, the same table, together with a designer. And again, we, we call this, uh, 
in a similar way. We call this, we started calling this open source urbanism, but I think you're, you're absolutely right, it's about everybody can have a say in different way, based on his uh, interests, capacity, skills, age, and so on. I think maybe this is a good time to, um, to, to wrap up, but thank you, thank you for, a nice, for a nice conversation, and I hope we'll continue somewhere on the planet in the US or, or here. Thank you. So now we have the last session of the morning and we will have interaction as well. It's a very inspiring project that you're going to show us. Well, Clearly, I was struck uh, by this beautiful, interesting uh, uh, presentation. I know we continue. <laughs> it's a, a high-level discussion, and we have the honor of having one of the designer of a, a living example of uh, working place uh, design, sensitive working place. We have very little time, and therefore, without further ado, I will, uh, I hope that Florio was with us because he uh, asked question. So I think that uh, he thought it was important to have a discussion, so I give him the floor to illustrate this very important project he designed. So, Florian, we are referring to restyling of Enel headquarters in Via Margherita. It's a major restyling project. Then, of course, you will speak about it. Uh, it's uh, a major restyling project, not only uh, because of uh, uh, all what has been done, uh, all the investments uh, and the great energy invested, uh, but all the concept that we mentioned, i.e. sustainability and uh, well, psychophysical well-being of workers. So I think it's uh, an inspiring, successful project. So I'm very interested in listening to your presentation. In realtà nel nel nell'intervento di oggi come a colleague uh, should have uh, participated but unfortunately your colleague could not be with us and uh, however Vincenzo Panasiti could not be with us. However, Florian will speak about it. And without further ado, I give you the floor. Thank you very much, Roberta. Thank you for your kind introduction. And the topic uh, today is uh, on uh, a very important uh, uh, project uh, carried out with our partners uh, in Rome. and. Uh, we uh, were there from the very beginning, from the uh, uh, competition, and uh, it's uh, the project is going well. It's underway, but we have not published 100%. So let's look at the design. We cannot show you, I say, from the beginning, There are no images uh, to show you, which should be shown when we speak of workspaces. I just tell you the story, and then I show you the uh, refurbishing and architectural design. We will follow you step by step, and you will show us uh, this is just the first of many to follow. We had also the Festival of Architecture, so we will follow you. Okay, my colleague Vincenzo Panasiti would have presented uh, the in-building 
uh, modeling information which was uh, quite relevant from the bidding phase uh, and uh, this is something that would be ongoing uh, also maintenance uh, is part of uh, the project uh, Unfortunately, Vincenzo is not with us. I will present also his uh, part, but I'm not an expert. So I want to get closer to my slides so that I don't have to turn around. So let's start from the uh, project. I speak Italian if it's fine. I understand that you get the translation in English if it's fine, so it's better. So it is in a central area of Rome. It's a building of uh, the 60 and is a huge building in this uh, context of a historical building in close to Villa Albani. It's a big volume, building volume, that defines uh, the urban area and has uh, an impact on all nearby areas. It's a special area for a multinational headquarter. It impacts uh, at environmental level, which is not what happens in the outskirts. It's in the center of Rome. It's a beautiful area. And uh, this is uh, the structure. There are these five bars connected by this uh, uh, sort of rod along Via Arno. There is uh, a big uh, square, 80,000 square meter. And the project envisages regeneration of uh, the building by maintaining what can be maintained, restructuring, refurbishing, uh, and uh, reorganizing from scratch. Because of course, uh, there are some, there is a mismatch. So it was designed in the 60s. And you see these cubicles shown by Carlo, while we no longer work in cubicles. So we analyze the volume and the organizational structure of the building. We so that uh, it's uh, space is uh, uh, not well structured is fragmented. We have 50,000 square meter uh, on the topsoil and uh, the use is not consistent with the uh, future vision of Enel of having an agile uh, approach to work. They use both uh, uh, remote working and uh, working in the office. So they want to attract people to come to the office. Otherwise, people prefer to work remotely from home. And uh, if no one comes to the office, of course, uh, the result is less performing. So on the basis of this premise, we organized a new strategy of the building. The building had uh, up to eight different accesses that were used every day. So people were not meeting. And uh, they get from uh, their uh, entrance point and went to their cubicle, totally isolated. Why we uh, have a new idea that creates a certain movement. We have well-defined access, one main access with a big lobby where people can meet and talk to each other and then move around. And then uh, all what contributes uh, to the workspace. Uh, uh, so important spaces in a project like this. 
just to give you an example um, uh, catering uh, crash uh, corridors uh, workspaces where people just meet so a concept that was defined as building as a city that is to say conglomerates of different functions that uh, um, are important for the core of the building building as a city is a concept that uh, um, integrates puts together a different function not only work uh, starting from the assumption that uh, there are different type of work uh, resident uh, nomad uh, workers uh, and uh, there is a cross contamination we have hospitality co-working traveling so concierge services uh, desk sharing etc and uh, this helps uh, in bringing about flexibility in a structure where spaces can be used uh, in an agile manner, which means uh, during the daytime uh, functions are different. During the week, uh, we have different people working there, and uh, therefore everything is somehow different. I go there and based on what I have to do that day. I choose the space I'm going to use, uh, which building I have to go, uh, who I have to meet. So this is uh, somehow connected uh, to uh, Gatoradi intelligent use, uh, which explains uh, the different connection, the different uses that uh, must be matched by the uh, connect the architectonical design so you see um, working modes change you can have an individual desk which is uh, different and must be flexible because tomorrow will change again so flexibility is really important and uh, we can use a different configuration, worker configuration. This has to be, uh, of course, uh, considered uh, in uh, designing uh, uh, pipeline connection, wiring, uh, and uh, we are convinced uh, any uh, to do this uh, because uh, for their headquarters is a strategic decision how to use uh, their workspaces and 90% is open space with uh, great flexibility and agility. So I wanted to show you some slides. Uh, how do we interpret the workspace? So we will meet again because today I cannot show it to you. So we start with the, the building. Where are we? What can we maintain? What should we pull down? How can we refurbish it? And uh, there are some uh, inefficiency in uh, the envelope that is uh, totally uh, rebuilt redundancy in vertical connection, many staircases that are not used uh, and were totally useless uh, because there was no real communication within the building. So the idea of promoting horizontal connections, uh, some greenery inside and outside the building because landscaping is very important. There was no landscaping in the building. And given the size and considering the uh, suburb uh, that is uh, very green, even if it's a built area, and Enel had no green uh, areas, therefore we were somehow impacted by the setting in our design. So our decision was uh, to have uh, a very performing facade with the possibility of have some uh, aeration uh, um, slot, let's say, so that 
sunscreening um, with the window uh, glazing and so with glass sorry and uh, a sustainable solution in terms of uh, uh, system plans and another important decision was to create a buffer zone towards Viale Regina Margherita which uh, gives uh, a sort of unity to the building and uh, ha creates a, a buffer zone this uh, is uh, the uh, ground floor you see very dense very compact uh, very little free space uh, huge volumes uh, that have to be well managed in order to make them more human to have more light so we decided to have some courtyards uh, i don't know whether i can show them do you see them they're here so that we can have light and uh, here we have an auditorium that uh, can be uh, partially used by um, external users. And then we have so conference spaces. The f first floor is uh, also uh, rich in volume. We have bookable uh, desktop with different functions and spaces uh, like these. Uh, like these here. These are conference spaces, other special spaces uh, for special needs, uh, strategic needs of NL more than uh, So technical elements uh, and not uh, mere daily office work. Then we have the typical floor that is organized with this sort of uh, sticks, as we call them, and uh, we have uh, spaces that are full of light because these sticks are not very efficient but are full of light we uh, try to make them as effective as possible but uh, quality is uh, what we wanted to have and we paid in terms of efficiency because you see how uh, narrow are these sticks as i call them here you see this buffer area Verdi, che utilizziamo. Uh, greenhouses that we use as uh, areas for to take breaks or to meet and they're situated on different levels and they occupy the head of the building overlooking Via Regina Margherita. This is the forum, the large uh, entrance that connects everything where there's another specificity because instead of getting people to the lift uh, through this, there's a, a dual staircase to get to the first floor which together with the ground floor is the space that unites everything and which is therefore important to connect it in a strong way not through lifts but with uh, scenographic uh, staircases that we've introduced here at this point let's take a look at the envelope very big very big size, 100,000 square meters in facades to be created. The main facade overlooks uh, Viale Regina Margherita. And again, we can see the various sticks that are connected to create the atrium, the entrance, the entrance forum. Whereas overlooking Via Arno here, the building is lower. We have some green where there is uh, a garden and a jogging or walking area, a space that invites inhabitants and connects all the spaces horizontally. The facade 
is very, uh, is very high performance, very sophisticated in the choice of the materials, the glass, in order to have a high performance in terms of heat gain factor. So solar energy is kept out in the summer, but instead is used in winter, and there's shading, necessary shading to avoid glare and um, to protect against uh, sun rays. Uh, and then in terms of acoustic uh, uh, insulation, this is another important aspect, and this is supported by those buffer areas, which besides being hermetically protected, they also give the opportunity to um, create a distance between working areas and noisy areas. There, and there are a number of facade types that become one and which are distinct in terms of performance and geometrical terms and in sunscreen. The typical one of offices in the northwest area. It doesn't require specific external sunscreens, whereas in the case of the southeast facade, we have those fins that add an external sun protection, so minimal shading to uh, Ma better manage uh, the impact of the sun. The greenhouses overlooking uh, Riviale Gina Marchetta, which we use as a buffer, have a sort of cold facade. There's a sort of bioclimatic greenhouse effect. So the uh, lateral facades are open so as to avoid overheating, and instead, uh, the part that is colder is closed again. Uh, this is something that is calculated accurately and simulated uh, by experts, but without artificial cooling or heating. The facade of the forum is simpler, full height with very important structures. And now a quick overview regarding biophilia, which is something we have at heart because I repeat, green in a building of this size is of strategic importance ultimately. It's not merely decorative. You can't live in 80,000 square meters without any green, so there's an external uh, part that makes the open courtyards very much livable, and there are some green areas for special use, such as the uh, uh, small kitchen gardens that will be available to users, and the jogging course, the uh, running course, and then there's a technical green area. We call it technical because it has a, a full-fledged function. There are some well-carried-out studies that can help us measure how much green and what type of green is necessary in relation to the working area, and that is included within the office. So we have a parameter, 0 0.35 square meters, sorry, 0 0.6 square meters for uh, 0 0.35 square meters per workstation. Um, and this helps create a positive working climate together with the internal courtyards which include large trees, very uh, in dense green, and which are very visible from within. And uh, again, this is due to the fact that the building is very transparent. The building was designed to be, receive the LEED Gold certification. Obviously, this certification will be obtained once the building has been completed. We have a number of measures that have been adopted to ensure that certification, which specifies the sustainability of the building itself in, in technical terms, whilst another type of certification is the, the one that certifies in a relatively scientific way between 
what is examined in a scientific analysis and what is actually uh, uh, made. There is an interpretation gap, but it gives us measures that can help us make the space is livable uh, and uh, comfortable and inhabitable. So uh, according to the certification, we have a method to measure the quality of internal spaces um, for which uh, for us architects, I mean, we may have a good idea of how to do that, but for multinationals such as Enel, it's very important to measure and certify and to explain to users, to shareholders and the public at large the quality of the various workstations. So, again, so there's a a very accurate uh, design layout with a huge uh, team of consultants. It's not all our work. And today, we're in the middle of the building yard with this. Uh, and the facade is at a good stage in Viale Regina Margherita. You can go there and look at it. This is the southern part here that is almost complete. Uh, and the works inside have begun, whereas northwards, there's still a part that is being rebuilt because we encountered some problems with the structures which couldn't have been foreseen before. So some floors in that northern part were demolished and rebuilt. And luckily, most of the structures remained intact, strengthened perhaps in a, an important way to achieve seismic performances that are completely different today, also because NO needs the building to be certified again as a strategic building that will remain intact uh, and to, uh, that can help people uh, uh, leave the building in case of an earthquake, but also that it remains intact. This was a, uh, a daunting task in which we succeeded in achieving thanks to advanced technology, using carbon fibers for some pillars and other pillars were coated in a more traditional way to uh, achieve this sort of performance. And from here, from this point on, my colleague was supposed to take the floor. I'll be going through the slides more quickly. What I'd like to say is that the complexity, the size, and the speed of these kind of works, even though we're talking about many years, is feasible thanks to the advanced management of information and in building information is based on, on building information modeling in BIM, which creates a platform of information about the building that has to be constructed or an existing building. We start off from there. with a cloud of dots, so a detailed measurement of all the parts of the building that remain in. It was, that procedure was performed twice at the beginning when the building was there in place uh, with all the facades and after the strip out when the various parts of the structure were exposed. The procedure was repeated to gradually update the model or rather the models because we're talking about many different models provided by the group of consultants. Each had his own two allow for these uh, type of use. So we have BIM management, we have a model analysis, so simulations that can be made thanks to these models regarding uh, the uh, exhaust, uh, the smoke uh, stations, uh, solar radiation and uh, heating and air flows inside offices. And that's something important to establish to ensure the comfort of the workstation. All this is done based on the various models that make up the project. So 3D modeling, but above all, this huge collection of data 
we use computational design too, which in this case was used for only some spaces to experiment at the ideal use of spaces for workstations. And computational design means being helped by a sort of artificial intelligence, which helps us see not the 5, 10, or 20 variations that we can develop using the traditional work of architects, but hundreds of variations, filter them according to a number of criteria, and get some feedback, get some support for our work. Analytics is, of course, a part that allows each team member, uh, so the person in charge of systems, to properly use what the architect has designed uh, and uh, so on. So uh, the models are parametric. This is the basis. And so we don't have just 3D modeling, but the information that each element uh, in this model brings with it. We have uh, developed an advanced approach, very appro advanced approach in the use of, of BIM. These, in our office, we have an important group. Uh, one of the members was Vincenzo was supposed to be here to explain everything more uh, thoroughly. So we have uh, some members of our team who have some links and management uh, ways that can help create links to all the members of the team. So we have a very thorough organization and effective and uh, this is, has been growing steadily and from since 2007, since we started with our first uh, uh, BIM project. It, uh, so we've grown more and more over the years, and you can see the figures by the people who deal with uh, BIM management at our office. I say management because. It's uh, ex exponentials, or yes, and uh, this exponential nature is tied to the fact that oh, everybody in the office works with BIM because that's how work is organized. We're discovering some places where we don't there isn't the utmost efficacy, such as co tenders or collaboration with uh, landscape architects or other team members. There, we always find a way to connect it to the, uh, with the uh, BIM world because that brings us the efficiency that we need to manage a problem. This is a project for the Italian Postal Administration that we've done. And the, from there on, we started to develop other things. I'll move very briefly. It's all about information. Even from a regulatory point of view, we are trying to influence how this is done with the presence of our BIM managers in the forum that manages the definition of BIM or the applica its application today. We're always seeking to create structured information, well-structured information following the initial indications of the client and here too. There is an approach, a well-defined uh, process structure. When the client starts with the project, the uh, he defines the employer information requirements, i.e. initial requirements, uh, and we respond with with our structures. We develop the idea of how to apply a BIM to the requirements and how to organize it. So, so uh, we have to start from non-structured data and, and BIM will help us make this data structured in such a way as to become readable as we're accustomed to reading a map. Everybody knows what this means because it's a structure of data. If we 
look at some unstructured data, like on the left hand side, something different you have to start studying in detail. And you may st take an hour to study, whereas instead, uh, with uh, a structured set of data, you could understand that much more quickly. Now, here are some models of the building. This is just to say that this method uh, um, uh, conveys an, an image and uh, a, a building. There are no surprises uh, or for facades, but there are some surprises in the case of uh, legacy uh, structures. So this is more or less it. We have our internal structure, how we cooperate. We have the various models of the various components, interior design, building engineering and architecture. And where here we can add uh, the facades, uh, ex experts, and uh, structure experts. And all this flows into a coordinated model that is transferred to the client. Not all parts of the model or the models have the same level of processing, even though in this case, Everything was uh, processed in a very detailed manner. But to go beyond, uh, we have identified errors that need to be developed on, not until the last screw, but to a level that also helps uh, evaluate the airflows uh, in Roma. So, so we have to consider the windows, the structure, the characteristics. So the model knows that the sun will arrive at a given time of day, at a given angle. All this information is all connected for those areas. Some even beyond facades are informed everywhere. And from there, we can move on to define performance requirements. And from there, uh, project uh, specifications because besides modeling, so the collection of information from then on, we on we proceed to building. So what does that mean? You measure, you go into the market, and uh, so we need to create a framework, a collaborative framework that includes contractors and all the elements that contribute to the building are the project management and the client again. And we get to this complexity of data and this level of data coordination that allows us to go to the market in a coordinated way and create with the necessary details and rules and showrooms combining all the various elements of the building in a manageable platform and to get to the final solution that is built. There are some uh, visualization aspects. Uh, the most beautiful images are rendered separately, but an image like the one on the top left is comes from the uh, is basically obtained uh, and can be seen almost live. And this is an aspect that uh, helps us design and control uh, such a complex design. This is another example of one of these mock-up areas where you can see all the structural elements, the systems accurately coordinated in such a way as to work in very limited spaces and which we have the inner envelope of our architectural finishes uh, and which are coordinated. So at this point, there, to get this kind of coordination, there are various uh, options. There's clash detection that we have. Uh, and this, in an almost semi-automated manner, it gives us some 
feedback uh, uh, on how the extent to which there's an overlap between elements or so, uh, air channels that overlap with structural elements. The software gives us back this information and shows us where this point and then we go there as we've always done and we call the uh, uh, rated experts uh, to solve the problem, it's remodeled and the clash disappears from the next detection. To make it re disappear, there's the other element, uh, namely clash tracking, so detailed documentation of all the clashes that are identified, and they can be 1,000, 2,000, even more at the beginning, which are then reduced not individually, but by the hundreds, because you find that as one component can be that is repetitive, it can be modified. So you have a number of clashes that disappear. To may really understand whether they have disappeared on the platform, there is a list where you can make comments and um, trace back the solutions and answers until the, it's uh, solved. The matrix tells us which models are uh, clashing to check the coordination. And here is where we are. We were working in building R with this model, which is something that workers are not too happy about because they're not used to it yet. For the NL project, we found some very good workers, excellent management, and they use these components uh, uh, 100%. And this is important because clearly it is uh, possible to create uh, output documentation. This is something that we always do, in, and we did it in this case. But ultimately, the complexity of the project uh, is seen in the model. So the mason worker has to consult the model to understand where to erect the wall. But those who manage things before and defines where the wall has to be po positioned uh, provides a mason worker. Uh, so. Um, Okay, your time is okay. I'll end with that. Okay, fine. Thank you. We thank you, and I have to say, I wouldn't know what to add to this presentation because it really concludes all the things we've discussed so far in an excellent way manner with a concrete example of the principles we discussed today applied. So I would really like to thank Florian Thornwood. I'd like to thank him wholeheartedly. And uh, he's in Milan, uh, so he's not here in Rome. So he'll probably take the opportunity to hop over to the building yard and see this creature that is growing. And we'll stay, keep in touch, and we hope to be able to witness this event, this project, as it uh, gradually moves forward. Thank you for your attention. Now we have. Uh, I hope that many of you will stay in the afternoon too, and we'll be back after a short break. Thank you to everybody. Thank you. Grazie mille. Hai fatto se vuoi venire tu a introdurre c'è un light lunch se volete e lascio Livio Ciappetta il nostro coordinatore didattico. Buongiorno a tutti e a tutte, solamente un minuto per darvi il benvenuto, per dirvi che il Light Lunch... I'm here to say that the Light Lunch is offered by the Castel Fusano Catering Center. We are a three-year school, we apply uh, the sandwich system, so school training. And uh, I'm particularly pleased to underline that uh, we use uh, a teaching methodology that is uh, Bill and Cashin. So we have uh, uh, our senior students uh, accompanied by students of first year that come uh, together with senior uh, mates to learn from teachers, but also learn from senior um, classmates. Thank you.